in. All right, guys, so welcome to uh, lecture three. Hi, Carol. How are you well? I'm good, thank you. And you? Good, I'm well, thank you. All right, so in this lecture, we get good. introduced to Boaz and <laughs> his amazing character. But we also get to see Ruth's character being flushed <laughs> out even more. Um, and there's something that's sitting under the surface that gives us a window into something that changes the story completely. Uh, it's had a huge, huge impact on my life, and that's why I like this story so much. And that's why I go, I try and get deeper and deeper as as new material comes out and new ideas come out. Um, and I believe it can have a huge, hopefully, a huge impact on your life as well. So we are going to jump right back into this lecture on a series on Ruth and this amazing book in the Hebrew Scripture. And we're going to coming off a teaching that I did last week on the whole thing of cleaning to the community and how it's important to be a part of the community. And we looked at what Naomi and Ruth conversation was. And one of the most pivotal moments in the book of Ruth, I think, is that you have Ruth cleaning on to Naomi and saying, I'm with you to the end. And she says all that beautiful thing where you go, I go, and all that kind of stuff. And Naomi, though, is still struggling with this. And this is just a part of the grieving process for Naomi. She's moving through it. She's still in the stage of being angry and upset. And if you ever... Uh, done any of the uh, material or no material from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the five stages of grief, you will know that one of them is anger. And it's all right to be angry. And it's all right to be upset, whether you're upset with God, whether you're upset with people. It's one of those stages that you psychologically, emotionally need to go through. And we see that because at the end of the chapter, one, she says to the people of Bethlehem, don't call me Naomi. So when people say, isn't this Naomi? And she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty dealt very bitterly with me. Now, Naomi means pleasant or the pleasant one. And she says, don't call me pleasant or the pleasant one. In fact, in fact, call me Mara. Now, Mara means bitter. And if you've done the Passover with me, we, we speak about the Maron, which is the bitter herbs. So Mara means bitter, bitter. So she said, don't call me pleasant Naomi, but call me Mara, which is bitter. And then you see that playing out as she says, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly um, with me. So she is still going through that grieving process. And then we move to the next verse. And she continues by saying, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So she's still on that me, 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 me kind of um, conversation. Notice that she says, has the, brought, uh, the Lord has brought me back empty. And I just wonder, in this moment, what is Ruth thinking? Because Ruth is just that you I'm going to go with you. I'm going to leave my own people. I'm going to make your people my people and so on and so on. And and one will think that that will fill up Naomi to a certain extent. And then she says, well, I'm coming up empty. And sort of like Ruth is, there, is thinking, well, what about me? She has just given up everything to come alongside of Naomi. And Naomi is not empty. But that's how she feels. And and as I mentioned in the previous lecture, evil wants to make you believe that in your hardship, you are all alone. And she's not. Ruth is right alongside of her. And we still do that. You know, we still like when we're in depressed, in depression and stuff like that, we might not share it with people. And the first thing we're going to do is we're not going to look inwardly and go, oh, you know, poor me and all that kind of stuff. And so... It has kind of this dark, this dismal kind of feel towards the end of chapter one. And the last verse the, of chapter one, uh, let me just let Annette go in, come in. 
So uh, the one sense of hope, because we read in the end of chapter one, so Naomi returns, Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and it came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So it finishes with a bit of a dark, kind of dismal kind of feel towards it. But now we think to yourself, okay, um, Ruth is still with her, even though Naomi doesn't acknowledge it. And they come to Bethlehem, the birthplace, the place where they came from, and it says at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, you have the plowing and the sowing season in late autumn in Israel. And barley and the weeds are planted at about the same time. But then the barley heads first come out because it only needs eight inches of rain. It doesn't need a lot of rain. Wheat comes after because it needs a little bit more, 12 inches and more of rain for the first part of the wheat to come out. And so if it's the beginning of the barley harvest, we're digging probably somewhere in the beginning of April. Now, remember, Israel is, is the northern hemisphere, so it's opposite to us. And because this is the first time thing to come to fruition by way of the field crop or even the orchard crop, it was a symbol of great things that came, that was going to come. So the reason for it, with them mentioning that they're coming at the barley harvest, is really giving us hope because you think, okay, well, they came right at the right time. Things are starting to grow. Things are starting to bud. Because remember, they're coming to Israel. They left Moab because there is a drought in Moab, severe drought in Moab. So to come at the right time, that's a big deal. And so there is hope on the scene because the barley harvest is underway. And then as we move into chapter 2, we read, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Remember, I wasn't very fond and I wasn't very much on the side of Naomi. I still think that she's got things up her sleeve and we're going to see in the next few lectures how she orchestrates a lot of stuff. But all of a sudden, I thought there was no one. All of a sudden, we're finding that there is someone from the clan of Elimelech. And we're going to find out later that there wasn't only one person, there were two people. So it's not quite that she had no one. Um, to look after her. But anyway, so we are now introduced to the character of Boaz. And the first thing that we are told, other than he is a relative, is that he is a worthy man. In Hebrew, this phrase, Gibor Chayal, so the H-A-R-Y-I-L is Chayal, Gibor Chayal, and it can be translated as a mighty man, as in being wealthy in some translation, uh, they will say that it has to do with wealth, but more, uh, more than not, scholars believe it's other part of what this phrase can mean is that it intended in Ruth 2 is a man of standing, a man of valor, or a man of noble character. And we are told that this is a good man. Boaz is not just a man, but he's a good man. And we are told that his name is Boaz. Now, we've mentioned throughout the series so far that names play into the storyline. And so we have said that Ruth means friend. And we looked at some of these other names as well. And we just looked at Naomi and Mara. And now we get to add another one to the list. And it's Boaz, whose name means in him is strength. And that's a great name in this movie, in, in, this movie, in, the, in, in the story, isn't it? Okay. What a great meaning for this new character because, I mean, we need someone of strength, don't we? And some of you may go, well, Boaz, yeah, I know from Ruth, but there is also another connection in the Hebrew Scripture. And in one other places in Solomon Temple, that the two pillars at the entrance to the temple were called Yaguin and Boaz. And so you have this even in a temple, just the strength, the idea around what Boaz means, because, I mean, Yaquin and Boaz were the two pillars, main pillars that were holding this, this temple of Solomon. And then we read, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. 
And she said to her, go, my daughter. So Ruth recognizes that Naomi is late in life. She doesn't have the capacity to do hard work. And Ruth says, I'm willing to do the hard work to provide for you and to provide for me. And the word that is used here is that she is going to go and she's going to glean. Okay? Now, the process of gleaning entails that after the reapers have been going through the field and cutting the sheaves of grain and pulling them out and bringing them into stalks and making them into, uh, you know, uh, bunching them together, some may fall by the wayside. Some don't get collected. Some don't get picked up. And the process of gleaning was that people could come into the field and pick up the leftovers in order to have what they need. And by the way, more than that, each field had to have 10%, the corner 10% of the field had to be set aside for the poor. Okay, so normally you will get 10% of the field, which will be set aside, the tithing. You guys who are in the hill, we've been talking about that for the last few Sundays. So this is not a 10%. And by the way, this is how you make it a field kosher, okay, by setting aside 10%. But over and above that, gleaning was that. So going back into tithing into the church and all that kind of stuff, okay? You say, I'm tithing 10%. That's great. But, you know, I'm, I'm maybe I'm, I'm actually tithing 15% because I give my 10% and then I give, you know, every Sunday and I pay for this and I pay for that. That is not tithing. Tithing is a 10%. The 5% extra or the other 10% extra, whatever extra, that's gleaning. That's over and above. And this is where it came from, the whole idea of, of gleaning was that people could come into the field there and pick up the leftovers in order to have what they need. And that is what she is referring to. And it's during her doing this that we read that Boaz came to Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. So first words from Boaz's lips are the Lord be with you. Just a warm, tender moment that again we see in the character of Boaz. And, 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 and us and those who hear the story for the first time will say, well, there is hope. There is something underneath the surface in here. Guys, is there any questions so far? Or observation? I was just thinking of how that I could have to listen again. To Sorry, my, uh, Mike, your microphone is on, so I couldn't hear what Carol was mm. saying. Sorry, Carol, can you re repeat that, please? I was saying that I, I need to listen again so that I can take notes on the 10% the and the gleaning and the that's on the farm and all of that, of how much was left over. Yes, yeah. You see, often, often, yeah, often we do, we make that mistake, especially in churches where we say, but you know, you know, I tithe more than 10%. And one of the things I reminded my congregation on Sunday was tithing is 10%, 10%. If you always used to be 10%, it is 10%, and it will always be 10%. It's not going to go up, it's not going to go down. It's 10%, okay? Anything over and above, is gleaning, and this is where it comes from because Boaz or any of the farmers didn't have to do that, okay? But because, as I said, they will give 10%. Normally, it's a corner of your field, 10% of your field. So, whatever the size of your field is, 10% of it in the corner will be left for those you need, and that's fine, and that, that is more than enough. But the gleaning practice is over and above, and because we are told that. He was a, a, a man of noble character. That he was Gibor Kayal. He was a man after God's a God on 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 heart. Then he does that extra bit, that that gleaning bit, and 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 the practice of gleaning was that that if you want to go over and above your required ten percent, okay, um, 
that is then the whole thing of gleaning. Okay. So Boaz said to his young men, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this, referring to Ruth. And a servant who had, who was in charge of the reapers answered, she's a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the crown of Moab. Can you see how they're emphasizing of the fact that she's a Moabite? Because remember I said, mm. they don't like the Moabites. Okay? There is a prohibition against the Moabites, and especially against the Moabite, Moabite woman. They, they, they were women who were, who were not of good character. Okay? And so mm. the author... Mentioning it, you see how that Moabite woman, the cam, the one who came from Moab. Okay, so they're really trying to stick it in there. And she said, meaning what Ruth has said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she already displaying that she has an understanding of the Torah. She has an understanding of the whole gleaning thing. Because remember, she said she's a Moabite woman. There's no way that this is practiced in Moab. So maybe her husband told her about this and taught her the way of the Torah. Maybe her father-in-law told her about it. And maybe her mother-in-law. But she definitely had an understanding of these gleaning that that was in place. And she said, well, let your, that, why she said, let your people be my people. Well, your people means your culture, your ways. So she was already in the process, even though she's being labeled as a mobile woman, she's already displaying characters of assimilating, if you will, into the culture of your people will become our people. So she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. So she came and has re remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in a house for a little while. Now, this reference to she has been sitting in the house, don't think that she's sitting in an air-conditioned house. They didn't have that in the ancient world. This is actually a reference to a little tent-like structure that they built with during the, the heat of the day, during the respite time period or the siesta, if you will, period. She's just sitting under the like an outdoor covering that's providing some shade. So she has been working throughout the morning. Boaz recognizes her and he begins to inquire of her. Now, what's so compelling about this is, one, the truth is willing to jump in and do the work that is necessary. She's not expecting it to just come to her, but also that she has a capacity to glean. Because, as I said, what we find in the Torah are a series of passages where God commands his people to allow those who are in need to be able to glean in the field. And as you recall, the story of Ruth is taking place during the time of the judges, where everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. But here, Boaz is doing what is right in the Lord's eyes. It's an un Ugly, bloody, chaotic, dark time in Israel history, and the word of God is being rejected. It's being re rejected right, left, and center, if you will. And yet, based on what we see in Boaz's field, is that he is a man of God's word. He's living out the instructions that God commanded his people to do. And so you see that this has got to be somewhere in his heritage line that this, is, that this has just been part of his family or what his family does. Because, I mean, he's obviously been raised properly to, to understand the Torah and to obey the Torah, to understand God and obey God's commandment. Because people aren't walking around with scrolls of God, of the Word of God in their satchels or in their backpack. They didn't do that, and especially in the time of judges that didn't. The Word of God was passed down through generations. It was passed down verbally it was stories and and so on and yes there are scrolls but nobody has their own copy but clearly the word of god has taken root in boa's life because we see god's commandment being played out in his story and you can check this out on your own time but i do want to to show you deuteronomy 24 19 because this is what it says when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheave in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the foreigner. 
and, and think immigrant, think surgeon here, okay? The fatherless and the widows. Now, who's a widow? Naomi. Who's a widow? Uh, 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 Ruth, okay? That the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. And these were the three most uh, uh, vulnerable groups in the ancient world. The foreigners, the immigrants, the sojourn, the fatherless, and well as the widows. And in this story, Ruth actually checks off two boxes that we know for certain. She's a foreigner and she's definitely a widow. Any any observation, any questions you want to ask before we continue? Okay. So now, when you get to this place in Deuteronomy, you recall that there is an earlier passage in Deuteronomy that talks about the heart of God in connection to this people group and why God commanded his people to live into this type of behavior. And you see here in Deuteronomy uh, 10, verse 18 to 19, it says, He executed justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the foreigner, giving him food and clothing. Love the foreigner, therefore, for you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. And that is precisely what Boaz is doing here. And you just see that there is this empathy to Boaz, not only in just his care and concern that you see with Ruth, but there may also be something in his own story that has enabled him to be empathetic towards the foreigners. So let's try and dig a little bit into the story of Boaz, okay, and see where we can connect him. We don't get this in the book of Ruth. We don't get this anywhere else in the Old Testament or the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew Scripture. But we've got a reference in a genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. If you go to the New Testament and you go to Matthew chapter 1, you will see a genealogy of Jesus. And Boaz's family, where a new detail is given, okay? Just notice this. And if you don't believe me, open in Matthew chapter 1. And it says in Sal Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Now, who is Rahab? The prostitute. The prostitute, the prostitute all the way from Jericho, okay? Now, if this is Rahab from the time period of the conquest of Jericho, which put us right at the beginning time of Judges, it fits the time period of Ruth. This is a prostitute in Jericho. Now, she wasn't a Jew. She wasn't an Israelite. She was a Canaanite woman who helped God's people and then became part of God's family. So much so that she was included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ himself. And she actually helps us a model of righteousness. So much so that in the letter of James chapter 2, and if this is in fact Rahab from the Hebrew scripture, if this is in fact, you know, his mother and not just someone that connects to the family line, then perhaps a part of Boa's empathy towards Ruth is to recognize that, wait a minute, you know what? I'm looking at this girl, and this is my mother's story. This is my mother Rahab's story. And maybe that gave Boaz that maybe his mother Rahab raised him in such a way that, you know, one of the things that they were, he was raised was... Um, was, you know, you look after the ones who are foreigners, the ones who are not necessarily Israelites. Uh, so it's something to consider uh, consider about uh, when it comes to Boaz. But you see that there is an empathy to Boaz, and you also see here in the story that there is a work ethic to Ruth. And this is really what comp compels me when I look at the story, and I want to center the rest of our time around this in just this character quality of Ruth to be in the field, to be gleaning and to do the work. Now recognize she doesn't just do this for a morning. In fact, at the end of chapter two, we read this astounding statement. It says, so she kept close to the young men of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. So it's not just a morning at the beginning of the barley harvest and then she gets Boaz's attention and then she she's done. No, 
She goes through how the whole barley harvest. She goes through the wheat harvest, probably through right through to the month of May. She is in the field gleaning probably every day, providing from the Omi and to also provide for herself. And in doing so, she wins over Boaz in the process. We don't necessarily know how long it took, but we know that for some reason, Boaz took notice of her. Not knowing exactly the ins and outs, we see that Boaz uh, uh, takes notice of her and has empathy, has compassion, and he keeps on showing Ruth that there is this compassion towards her. And there is a moment in chapter 2 where Ruth says, why are you treating me with such kindness? And notice what Bo's response is. And he says, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. In other words, he's obviously found out about her. Okay, I don't know if he's gone to the local gossip in Bethlehem or what, but he's obviously found out about the history of this Ruth. And he says, and how you left your father and your mother and your native land and come to the people that you did not know before. And you can see if we can take that suggestion that I said that maybe his mom Rahab taught him to be kind to foreigners, kind to those who are not a part of the Israelite. You can see how in his words he's emphasizing that not only does he hear about it, but you left your mom and your mom and mother, uh, your father and mother, you're fatherless and your native land. So I know you're a Moabite and that's okay. And you made these people your people. And you came to people that you didn't know before. Boa says, I'm compelled by you. I am compelled by your character. I'm compelled by your work ethics. I'm compelled by your chesed. Remember? the compassionate loyalty, your covenantal faith, your compassionate loyalty to the Omi, to give up everything and to come and be a part of a people that's not your own. And you go, what a powerful statement that Boaz makes. And then some of us are going, wow, well, that sounds a lot like what Abraham did in Genesis 12 verse 1, where now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kinder and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So, again, the listeners are going, you know, for someone who's a Moabite, this is amazing. And we know that Abram went, he did that. And so even Ruth is a Moabite. She's living into the quality and the impulse of Abraham to be able to go to a place that she doesn't know in order to be faithful to what she believes she is called to do. And so she wins over Boaz in the process. But what's more, in chapter 3, Boaz will say to her, and now my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all. Sorry, let me just get that. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. He's like, everybody knows your story. Everybody understands what you are like what your character is, what your work ethic is, and they are compelled by you as well. In other words, they are also standing back and going, this is amazing. You have won over the entire village. And again, astounding that she is a Moabite, an enemy of Israel in the minds of a lot of people. And, 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 and yet she's won everyone over. And I love what Dan Boas says next. And this is where I want to lock in. In and, 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 and for us to take this, may the Lord reward reward your work and may your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. He says, may the Lord reward your work. What an amazing statement to say that when Boaz just surveys who Ruth is, he's like, woman. You've got a work ethic, and it stems from your character, and you have compelled not only me, not only my men, but the entire village. May God reward you for that. You see, work ethic is a significant part of the story. And then I believe we need to recognize that when you have a great work ethic, whatever work you do, you actually are putting yourself in the path of blessing. 
guys from the hill that we we spoke about on Sunday, yesterday, we spoke about being in a path of blessing. We spoke about the whole thing of blessing and the anointing. And that challenge, I believe, for us, and just watching watching the story unfold, is how we are putting ourselves in a path of blessing. And we do that through working hard, having a real good work ethic. But it's not about working tirelessly. It's not about becoming a workaholic. It's also about working smart, that we work hard, we work smart, we engage in the best practices, we also engage in rest. We recognize that rest is not a reward. It's an engine for the best work that we have the capacity to do. And what's more, that we work hard, that we work smart, and we do it with integrity. And when we are doing that, we are putting ourselves in a place of blessing because we are giving God something to bless, to work with. And when we are putting ourselves in a path of blessing, when we are doing these things, we give God something to bless. We give God something to work with. And when we are doing it right, we can release the result to God and recognize that we've done our part and whatever God wants to do, God can do by way of blessing in return. And so may you consider how you can put yourself in a path of blessing. And we see in the story of Ruth, working hard is a critical component. Guys, we literally have a few more minutes. So uh, I'm going to, uh, we're not necessarily going to go into session two uh, because we are at the end. So the next slides are basically just questions. It will all be in your notes. And um, and um, I'm, I just want to read what we're going to do next uh, week. More ink has been spilled over what happens between Ruth and Boaz at the thrashing floor than any other scene in the book of Ruth. That's because Ruth 3 is loaded with sexually suggestive language. But the Bible is actually doing something incredibly beautiful and redemptive by inviting us to see Boaz and Ruth as models of integrity once again, who don't just pray with the lips, but also with action. And I hope by the end of next lecture, you'll understand what the biblical writer was up to and will be inspired to put legs to your prayer. So I encourage you to be a part of the next lecture. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Lachai. Thank you, Lachai. Thank you. Are there any questions before we get kicked off? Yeah. No, oh, I'm good. Interesting. No. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, Lachai, I have a question. Yes. Um, you started off by saying there was a, a particular part of this uh, lecture that really attracted your attention. Um, what was that? Uh, in particular, I mean, you've raised or you've highlighted a number of things. What was it in particular that that uh, attracted your attention to this whole book? Mervyn, I think I think uh, it's it's basically everything about this book. It's such a an amazing small book that, to me, coming from a Jewish background, you didn't know Jesus all my life. Uh, it just spells out Jesus. It, I mean, the character, uh, the characters. Uh, of Ruth and Boaz and what they're still to do in the next lecture and and what Boaz does in order to be able to legally um, inherit Ruth under his wings and the words that are going to be used and so on. It's just such a beautiful picture of what Jesus has done and he's doing for us. And I think that that's what really attracted me to, to this book and why I keep on going back because it's – Every time I look at it more, every time I read more stuff, there's more things that are happening um, that just excites me. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. And, and of course, uh, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's in, the, uh, in the backdrop of a, a bloody part of exactly. the history of Israel. Exactly, yeah. It's, it, it's quite the opposite to what's going on around them. That, that's right, yeah. All right, guys, we're going to get kicked out just now. So I'm going to say good night and um, yeah. I will send you the notes you. and the recording as well. Have a good week and we'll hopefully see each other next week. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I think they should rename this book. I think they should rename this book, Lachai, Ruth and Boaz. Because Boaz is an extremely strong character in it. That's you right, know? absolutely. You're absolutely right. It's not right? just Ruth. It's really how, how Boaz is reacting to every situation. That's His right. Strength. That's right. Absolutely. You're so right in it. You're so right. Thank All you. Right, guys. Good this. Bye-bye. If you've got Thank any you. comments, you can always email me or send it to me on, on WhatsApp. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Night-night. Night-night. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.